Good week, last week. Welcome to Katy Community Church. Before we begin our Bible lesson today, let's pause for a moment of silent prayer, which gives us each the opportunity to examine ourselves, make sure that we're in fellowship with God, and that we are filled with the Holy Spirit as a result, so that we will be prepared for the teaching of the Word of God today. And the way we do this, of course, as you know, is using the rebound technique which is based on 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, which says if we will confess our sins, which means to name or admit our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege and the opportunity that we have to come together in this very unique age and which we live, pray that you'll be with us as we continue our study on the victorious Christian way of life. Help each one of us to uh, be able to apply what they learn through this lesson so that it will truly make a difference in everyone's life so that we will be even better representatives of our Savior Jesus Christ as we continue to move through this life and on into eternity. We're excited today for everything that you have been doing for us in our lives, and we're excited about what you are going to continue to do uh, in our lives. So help us to be thankful, help us be prepared, help us to be consistent. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we've been talking about the unique age in which we live and the uniqueness of believers in this age and all the assets that God has given us that are unique to the church age in which we live, which never existed before. And when we started this lesson, I told you there were three different ways to, to look at or designate the Christian way of life, the victorious Christian way of life. The first is that uniqueness, how unique this age is. The second was the lifestyle of wisdom, which is what we're going to start today and talk about the lifestyle of wisdom. And then the final one was the protocol plan of God, which we'll get to as well. In Proverbs chapter 2, verses 6 through 15, it says, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Of course, that's Bible doctrine. He stores up sound wisdom. That's the proper application of doctrine. For the upright. Who are the upright? Those believers who are living their spiritual lives. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of the just guarding the paths of justice and he preserves the way of his godly ones his his children the royal family of god then you will understand righteousness and justice and fairness and every good path in life for wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul discretion will guard you Understanding will watch over you to deliver you from the way of evil, to deliver you from the man who speaks perverse things, to deliver from those who leave the paths of unrighteousness to walk in the ways of darkness, to deliver you from those who delight in doing evil and rejoice in the perverse ways of evil, to deliver you from those uh, from let me start over. To deliver you from whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. Who of us does not want spiritual wisdom? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, even if you're an unbeliever, you should want wisdom. But God's wisdom is so much greater than what the world has to offer or what they call wisdom. The lifestyle of wisdom for believers means advancing to spiritual maturity. And the way we do that is we advance through various stages of spiritual growth. We call them spiritual self 
self-esteem, spiritual self-confidence. That's spiritual self-esteem. The beginning of the effective use of the problem-solving devices of God's protocol plan for the church age in which we live. The second one is spiritual autonomy, which is spiritual independence and the continuation of effective function of the problem-solving devices of the protocol plan of God. Third is spiritual maturity, which is spiritual invincibility and maximum application of the problem-solving devices for the protocol plan of God. So just within that one paragraph there, we have a very large portion of the Christian way of life and how to have victory in that life. And as we grow spiritually, we pass through these stages of where we get to spiritual self-esteem, which is defined as respect for self, satisfaction with oneself, or a good opinion of oneself. So the great question we can all ask ourselves is, is this true of me? Do I indeed respect myself? Am I satisfied with myself? Do I have a good opinion of myself? God has a good opinion of you. Even as a sinner, even when you fail, God still has a good opinion of you. You're his child. And however you fail, and we all do, God still loves us with a fatherly love that cannot be compared to anything on this earth. And he wants the very best for you. But he wants us to respect ourselves. He wants us to be satisfied with who we are as believers in Christ. He wants us to have a good opinion of ourselves. The only way that we can do that as believers is to be consistent in living our spiritual lives and studying God's word and applying God's word. If you're not doing that as a Christian, you're going to be miserable. Remember what I always say, the most miserable people on earth are not unbelievers. They're believers who are not living their spiritual lives. That's where it all begins when you move into adulthood. We all start at the same place. We all start as spiritual babies. We move into the childhood phase and into the adolescence phase, and then into the adult phase. And that's where we all should be going. That's where we should be heading. We should be advancing towards spiritual maturity and beyond. Once you reach spiritual maturity, and you not necessarily some date in your mind, it's just when you reach the point in your life that is described in the Word of God that we call spiritual maturity. It's when you have a maximum amount of doctrine in your soul and you're using that a maximum amount of time. So spiritual self-esteem is where it all begins in a spiritual adulthood. It's confidence in what you know and how to put it in practice. And that's what we should be doing. We should be practicing we should be doers of the word and not hearers only. Every day that we wake up and we go about our daily routines, whatever they may be, and everybody's is different, it should be done as unto the Lord. We represent our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we should have enough knowledge by now in our souls, in our minds, that we can apply that information, that doctrine, to every situation in our lives. Are we going to always do it perfectly? No, we're not. But we also have the solution when we fail. So God has given us the plan. All we have to do is follow it. Spiritual self-esteem results in maximum humility. And you remember what humility is, right? It means that you're teachable. It's teachability. It's being able to say, I don't know everything. 
and setting our arrogance and our pride aside and learning what God has to say and following his plan, not our own plan or the plan of Satan's world system, but following God's plan. And sometimes we don't understand it. Sometimes we can't really know what God's plan is uh, for us in the future, but he has a plan. And as we move through the Christian life, he reveals that plan to us. He always knows what's coming in the future for us. So if you live your life with a personal sense of destiny, understanding that God has already put a plan in place for you, and you have the indwelling of God, the Holy Spirit, to guide you and empower you and teach you and show you what his plan is. God has done all the work. Christ did the work for us on the cross in providing our salvation. Now, God, the Holy Spirit, his ministry to us is to guide us and to teach us, help us recall what we've learned, help us apply what we've learned. But we have to be humble enough to receive it because remember, we still have volition. We still have a free will. We can throw up the stop sign at any time. But spiritual self-esteem is not only confidence in what you know, it's confidence in God. It's confidence in his word. It's not confidence in human viewpoint thinking. Remember my two of my favorite verses, or three of them here, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, and th uh, one through 3. I included three today in this lesson. I'm going to read them to you. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world system, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove or discover what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now listen to verse three. For through the grace given to me, Paul is saying, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself. This is humility. Than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. Spiritual self-esteem is really boils down to knowing who you are as a believer in Jesus Christ, what you have received as a result and what you are going to receive in the future. We have all the tools that we need. There's no excuse for any one of us to not live the spiritual life that God has planned for us. Spiritual self-esteem is attained through Bible doctrine in your soul. And as a result, things begin to come into focus, spiritually speaking. You've passed through those early stages of your Christian life. You've gone from being a baby Christian to, a, to childhood, to an adolescent. And now you've reached a point that you're in spiritual self-esteem as you're moving through these stages. And when you reach that, things begin to come in focus for you. You begin to understand what the Word of God really teaches, accurate doctrine instead of some religiosity or tabooism or ritualism or some other form of religion that has no meaning, only brings guilt and fear into your life. Man, when you start understanding God's word, you can relax and enjoy your life to the maximum and be a representative for Jesus Christ while you're doing it. 
Things like sharing the happiness of God, which begins with contentment, then becomes capacity for life, capacity for love and happiness in every circumstance of life. That's where we should be. Bible doctrines in a believer's soul and the proper application of doctrine to life in spiritual self-esteem, keeps our priorities straight, keeps them aligned with accurate doctrine, where we're not always swerving off the path. The proper application of Bible doctrine keeps us from getting the cart before the horse. Before any believer attempts to serve the Lord, okay, and we're all in full-time service, just some people don't do a very good job of it, Believers must first learn some doctrine. Failure to do this means getting the cart before the horse. For example, no believer can be an effective witness for Jesus Christ until they fully understand how to clearly present the gospel. An unclear presentation of the gospel only confuses the unbeliever. So we have to understand what our role is. We talked a lot about this in the, in the previous stage or the previous lessons under this category of the victorious spiritual life. So spiritual self-esteem keeps Christian service in its proper perspective. Christian self-esteem gives you the spiritual strength to avoid what some people say is beyond doctrine. It's a movement that says Bible doctrine's not enough. There must be more, which is normally tied to some emotional experience. There's something else out there that God has for me. I, I, I can feel it. No, there's not. You have everything you need right here in this book called the Bible. That's all we need as believers. We need to understand this book, and we need to apply the principles in this book. That's what will bring victory into our lives as Christians. So the advance to spiritual self-esteem occurs as we consistently learn and apply doctrine not by how we feel, not by emotion, some emotional experience. Here's some of the characteristics of spiritual self-esteem. Learning accurate Bible doctrine from a pastor teacher. Humility that we talked about, without which there's no teachability in life. The development and use of spiritual common sense and good judgment based on divine viewpoint thinking. That's what we just read in Romans chapter 12, verse 3. Good judgment. Good judgment is, is common sense. Proper application of doctrine to your thinking and your behavior. Understanding and utilization of the problem-solving devices. And you can't use those problem-solving devices if you don't know what they are and how they apply. And we all should know that. We've studied them numerous times. If you need to review them, go to the website. You can review them. They're there for you. Divine viewpoint thinking, replacing human viewpoint thinking. So that believers have the same mindset as Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And finally, Characteristics of self, spiritual self-esteem are making good decisions from a position of strength instead of making bad decisions from a position of weakness. Now, where's the strength come from? It comes from God. The Holy Spirit gives us, empowers us with divine power to live this spiritual life. We are indwelt by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There's no greater power ever in the universe that is greater than the power that's in you right this very moment. 
But we need to tap into that power. We need to use that power. And the way we do it is by applying the doctrine that's there in our souls, circulating in our souls. Spiritual self-esteem, as we said, also includes a personal sense of destiny. The doctrinal status of spiritual self-confidence means that doctrinal concepts are fully realized, though perhaps not fully developed. What does that mean? It means we understand what they are, but it takes development. We have to use them. The more you apply Bible doctrine, the easier it comes and the more um, easily it comes. You'll uh, begin to uh, automatic, that's the word I'm looking for, automatically comes. Because when you have that doctrine in your soul and it has saturated your soul and it's driven that human viewpoint thinking out of your thinking, back to somewhere in your subconscious, consciousness, then you begin to automatically think Bible doctrine. And any issue that comes up in your life, any decision you have to make, you make it based on that strength of doctrine in your soul and not on just what the world says about this or what someone ha else has done or someone else's advice. No, God's advice is the best advice and we find God's advice in the word of God. So having a personal sense of destiny is realizing what we already have, but also what we are going to have in the future. We already have a lot of doctrine in our soul. The question we have to ask ourselves, are, are we using that doctrine? Because Satan and his world system is not going to leave you alone as a believer, especially as an advancing believer. Those who aren't advancing in their spiritual life, he's got them. He's got them right where he wants them. Stay there, you Christians. Don't learn God's word. Don't apply God's word to your life. Just stay there, and he'll be happy. The ones he's not happy with are you and me, because we're advancing. We're moving forward in our Christian life. So it's vulnerability, and it's two things like the sins of arrogance or Self-deception or self-justification or self-absorption. Those are the arrogant skills, the complex of arrogant skills that we have to be careful of and not get distracted by the details of life and then start justifying our actions. God and his word should be number one priority in our lives. If it's not, we need to re-examine our relationship with God. Spiritual self-esteem recognizes that emotions, though they come from God and they're wonderful things to have, are never the basis for the spiritual life. Spiritual self-esteem continues to make Bible doctrine number one priority in life and fulfills the command that we find in Philippians chapter 3, verse 16, which says, let us keep on by that same standard to which we have attained. Let us keep on living. I think I've left out the word living. Keep, let us keep on living by that same standard to which we have attained. You're now in spiritual adulthood. Keep on keeping on. Don't let your guard down. Keep moving forward. Keep pouring doctrine into your soul. The more you put in there, the more human viewpoint is going to be driven out. Spiritual self-esteem eliminates setbacks and failures in life. Spiritual self-esteem eliminates arrogance as a rule for life. Emotion as a criterion for life and lack of problem solving. When you're living your spiritual life, these things aren't part of who you are. You're not arrogant. You're not living your life based on 
how you feel about something. And you're utilizing the problem solving devices. You're using the rebound technique. You're keeping short accounts. You're staying in fellowship with God. You're staying filled with the Holy Spirit. You're using the faith rest technique. You're claiming the promises of God. You're using grace orientation and doctrinal orientation and a personal sense of destiny and personal love for God and impersonal love for all mankind and sharing the happiness of God in occupation with Christ. You're using those every day of your life. Maybe not every one of them, but they work as a system. They're cohesive. Spiritual self-esteem is related to all of the problem-solving devices of the protocol plan of God. Spiritual self-esteem is confidence in the result of using those problem-solving devices, like the rebound technique, rather than in the reality and shock of your own sin. And we all have been there. We've all shocked ourselves with the things that we do. But what do we do about it? God's not shocked. He already knew in eternity past what we were going to do or not do. He's not shocked. So what do we do? We follow his solution to the problem. First John 1 John 1.9. We admit our sins to God. We acknowledge them to him. We call them as he calls them. And he'll forgive us those sins. And then not only that, God always does a little bit more. He also cleanses us from all unrighteousness, sins that we have forgotten, sins that perhaps we committed we didn't know were sins, didn't realize it at the time. But we did it. We wanted to do it, and we're responsible for it. But God, in his grace, cleanses us from all unrighteousness, which puts us back into fellowship with God. And when we're in fellowship with God, we're filled with the Holy Spirit as a result. And then we can continue our advance in the Christian life. Spiritual self-esteem is the knowledge that after admitting our sins to God, we recover fellowship with God, which results in the filling of the Holy Spirit being restored. Spiritual self-esteem means the effective use of the problem-solving devices. The successful, victorious Christian experience during life's disasters includes the following. Occupation with Christ replacing self-absorption or preoccupation with our problem. Preoccupation with our eyes on self. In other words, how am I going to solve this problem? Instead of how is God going to solve this problem for me? Therefore, you meet the disaster, and we're all going to have them if we haven't already, not with, not in preoccupation with self, not in complaining but through the principle of being occupied with Christ. This, this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. His mind is Bible doctrine. Number two, impersonal love for all mankind, meaning to live and let live and not be occupied with the behavior of others because their behavior is not going to be up to the standard that you're living if you're in spiritual self-esteem, if you're in spiritual adulthood, you're living God's standards. Others around you are not. The unbeliever has no clue. So what are they going to do? They're just going to react based on what they've been influenced by Satan's world system all of their life. So don't be shocked when somebody attacks you or speaks ill against you or is it addictive, or trying to do something to you, trying to get you fired at work, or trying to override something that you've done, or trying to take your place doing this or that. Don't be shocked by that. 
That's the world we live in. That's Satan's world system. We're above that. Three, sharing the happiness of God, which includes tranquility of soul and contentment, replacing eyes on the circumstances around you. Things are not going to get better in the world in which we live. We are moving toward the rapture of the church and what follows the rapture of the church, which is the tribulation. So things are not going to get better. But we have the power that we need. And this is why we have all this uniqueness in the church age is because this is an intensified period of time where Satan is and his demons are doing everything they can to keep you distracted. They don't want you to be a witness for the prosecution where God calls you up and says, look, Satan, look at this person. Look at this believer. Look how they live their life. They accept it the salvation solution that I offered them. Faith in Christ and what he did for us on the cross. And now they're living their spiritual lives. They're obeying me. They're living righteously in this life, in your system, Satan. Proving to Satan and the fallen angels that God is fair, God is just. Because Satan and the fallen angels rejected that. They rebelled against God. Spiritual self-esteem emphasizes the reality of the faith rest drill over the reality of one's problems, adversities, disasters, and stress situations. Spiritual self-esteem is grace orientation rather than circumstance orientation. We're always just oriented to the to the circumstance around us, and we're not oriented to God's grace and what he has promised to do about any situation we find ourselves in. Then we are going to be at a loss as to how to solve that issue. Think about, I always go back to thinking about Paul and the apostles sitting in a, in a dungeon, in a, in a Roman prison cell. Their circumstances were horrible. And what were they doing? They were singing praises to God. They were winning people to Christ who were in the, the guards, probably other prisoners, I don't know. They were content because they knew that was part of God's plan for their lives. And what happened? God brought them out of that. Our happiness should never depend on the circumstances around us. Our circumstances are not the issue in life. Bible doctrine's an issue, and it must be more real to us than the circumstance in which we find ourselves. Spiritual self-esteem is having a personal sense of destiny. Sharing the happiness of God, meaning maximum contentment in every circumstance of life, whether good or bad. God works all things together for good to those who love him. You're advancing in your spiritual life. Therefore, you love God. If you love God, God is working behind the scenes to work all things together for your good. Sometimes those things include disaster and testing and suffering, but they're all for your good. God is working them all out for your good. Spiritual self-esteem is the function of virtue love, personal love for God, impersonal love for all mankind. Spiritual self-esteem is the first stage of spiritual adulthood. The status of giving high priority to learning Bible doctrine, resulting in dependence on God's grace rather than depending on human power. 
Remember what the Apostle Paul, when he asked God, he had this thorn in his flesh, what it was, we're not really sure. But whatever it is, God, Paul prayed three times, Lord, take this away from me. Take this thorn in my flesh away. And what did God answer him? My grace is sufficient for you. Whatever you're going through, whatever circumstance you find yourself in, God's grace is sufficient. He will carry you through. What does he tell us? No testing has taken, overtaken us that is not common to man, but God, but God will not allow us to be tested above that which we are able to bear, but will with that give us a way of escape and a solution to that suffering, to that testing, to that circumstance in your life. Spiritual self-esteem recognizes the importance of our two power options. Do you remember what they are? Filling of God the Holy Spirit and Bible doctrine in your soul. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, he is guiding you. He is re helping you recall the doctrine that's in your soul. These are the two powers we have. The word of God is alive and powerful powerful. The word of God is alive and powerful. Spiritual self-esteem is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom is the result of learning and applying Bible doctrine. Understanding Bible doctrine and how to live the Christian way of life comes over a period of time as spiritual self-esteem is developed. It's progressive. It takes a while. So don't get frustrated with yourself. Just keep moving forward. When you trip and you fall and you fail, get back up. Use a rebound technique. Bounce back. Get back in fellowship and keep moving forward in your spiritual life. Don't beat yourself up. Don't get into some uh, guilt complex where you think that God is going to punish you. No. Judge yourself. You will not be judged. That's what that means. It means evaluate yourself and fix the problem. And then God doesn't have to bring divine discipline into your life because you fixed it through his word. Spiritual self-esteem results in the development of the believer's confidence in God's plan, we call it the protocol plan of God, which we will study in this series, as they continually see it working in their lives. When you start applying Bible doctrine on a consistent basis, you'll see it work. And as you see it work, you're going to say to yourself, wow, that's cool. Look what God did. Look how he worked out that situation for me. I think I'm going to try that again. Next time I have a problem, I'm going to think I'm going to try it God's way. Because the way I've been trying, it doesn't work very well. But that one time that I applied Bible doctrine to that situation, things really worked out. That's what we should be thinking. That's how we should be handling things in our lives. That's wisdom. That's application of doctrine. Spiritual self-esteem results in the development of our confidence in God's plan. God's plan is perfect. Our plan is flawed. And if you're living your plan, you're going to be a miserable Christian because it's not going to work. Only God's plan is going to work. Right thing must be done in a right way. The key to reaching spiritual self-esteem is love and respect for God and his word. If you love God and respect God's word, you will want to know it and you want, you're going to want to know as much as you can and you're going to want to apply as much as you can. And God, the Holy Spirit, is here to help each one of us as believers. 
Proverbs chapter 9, verses 9 and 10 says, Give instruction to a wise person. Wisdom comes through the word. And he will become still wiser. Teach a righteous person, that person who's living their spiritual life, and he will increase his insight, his understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It doesn't mean to be afraid of God. It means to be in awe of God, of who he is, and how God could indwell me. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. How can they indwell me, a sinner? It's grace. It's God's grace. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Spiritual self-esteem is attained through building a spiritual life within our souls. Living the spiritual life means understanding how the Christian way of life works related to all the assets that God has given us. We call them our portfolio of invisible assets. All this huge portfolio that God has given us. 40, at least 40 things the moment you said, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior. The moment you did that, bam, God gave you 40 things that we know of for sure. He also gave us the problem-solving devices and everything that we need to be victorious in the Christian way of life. And an understanding of the mechanics of the Christian way of life, in other words, how the Christian life works properly, correctly, is the first step in the development of spiritual self-esteem. It's where we have self-confidence. We know we're on the right track. We know that what's being taught to us is accurate. We can go to the word of God and we can read it for ourselves. This is accurate. And I'm going to follow this path of accuracy. And I'm not going to deviate. I'm not going to be distracted. I'm going to stay on the right path. And I know that if I stay on that path, that eventually... I'm going to reach a point in my life where no one can distract me, not even Satan himself, can distract me from living my spiritual life and glorifying my Savior who gave his life on the cross for me. Having attained spiritual self-esteem, means you can make proper doctrinal applications so that your life becomes full of meaning, full of purpose, and full of definition. In spiritual self-esteem, a believer keeps priorities aligned with accurate Bible doctrine. Whatever your priorities in life, I'm not saying that other priorities are, are bad or wrong, but the first priority in your life should be God and his word. Then you set your other priorities based on that. So whatever it is in your life that is a priority, it should align with accurate Bible doctrine. Priority number one is to learn Bible doctrine. Priority number two is to apply what you learn, which results in divine production, producing the character of Jesus Christ in your life. Spiritual self-esteem keeps Christian service in its proper perspective. Spiritual self-esteem gives you the spiritual knowledge to know the difference between, and this is so important, the difference between human good and divine good. Human good is done when you are not being filled or you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Because when you're doing that, you're doing it with the wrong motivation. You're doing it under human power and not under divine power. 
That's why we have to stay in fellowship with God a maximum amount of time. And when we're doing that and we're being guided and empowered by God, the Holy Spirit, then we are producing divine good. Spiritual self-esteem is characterized by the status, according to Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, of Christ being formed in you. That's what spiritual self-esteem, Christ has been formed in you. You are following the path that he walked while he was here on this earth. You are following his example. He is, after all, our prototype. He lived what we're living now under the filling of the Holy Spirit. We have the same power, the exact same power that Jesus Christ had in his humanity. We have no excuses. We have God has put together a plan for us that is easy if we'll stay within the plan. It becomes difficult when we keep stepping out and staying out for a period of time. Stay in fellowship. Keep short accounts. Stay in fellowship with God. Keep moving forward in your Christian life. Keep applying the Word of God. Learn the Word of God. Study the Word of God. Keep pouring it into your soul. Become absorbed with it. I think Paul uses the word, the impregnated word. <laughs> you know, make it part of who you are. You're everyday living. When people see you and talk to you and hear you, they should see the light of Jesus Christ in your life. If they're not, we need to re-examine ourselves. We're the only ones who know that, us and God. He knows what our spiritual lives, our true spiritual lives are really like. So let's stay on track. Let's get all of God's wisdom we can get. And the way we get is by learning and applying his word on a daily basis. Anybody have any questions or comments? I have a question. Okay. Uh, can you give us an example about the um, self-deception? Because I, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm a little confused with that. Uh, confused term. about self-deception? Yeah. Can you give me an example? Well, I mean, remember you remember there... Yeah, sure. I can give you. I can give you. I can tell you about that. Um, remember over in First um, John, chapter eight or chapter one, First John one verses eight and ten. Um, yeah. John said, "If we say we have no sin nature, we deceive ourselves. That's self-deception. Saying we don't sin, that's self-deception. Um, saying that our motives." The motives we had when we did whatever we did, which was actually wrong in a sin, deceiving ourselves into say, and self-justifying and saying that uh, that what I did was not really was was not against God's word. You know, well, who are you deceiving? You're not deceiving God. You're not deceiving the other person. You're not deceiving the people who know you. You know. There's a lot of people even who are in the church pews who are self-deceiving. They deceive themselves because what they do is they put on a show. They want to be seen. That's what the Pharisees did. They deceived themselves. They thought by going out and you know, with their fancy clothes and their eloquent speaking and all the praying out in public so everybody could see them, that that would uh, make people think they were spiritual. They were deceiving themselves. They think they were thinking God would approve of that, which he didn't. They deceived themselves. I don't know if that helps you or not. Does anybody else have a, an example maybe to share? Does that help at all, Miguel? Yeah, I thought I thought yeah, 
Yeah, because I was thinking that uh, self deception was like um, um, discourage, or something like that. I, I thought it was that, but uh, but now I got a clear picture of what you say. Okay, good, good. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I think that what you said, uh, self de uh, the self justification, is what comes to my mind, mm -hmm. like where we can. We can justify, say, well, you know, that wasn't so bad. Maybe, you know, I, that wasn't really, like you said, against us rules. Um, yeah. And we kind of do a dance around it instead of facing it, confessing it. Yeah, the one that just popped in my head when you say that is, oh, that was just a little white lie. You know, that's a term we yeah. use. Yeah. You know, a little white. Yeah. It's still a lie and it's still sin. So it can be white or green or blue, whatever color you want to make it, but it's still a lie. So, and you deceive yourself into saying, "Now oh, that's not really that bad," you know. Anybody else? Very good. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your wisdom. We thank you that you've offered it to us through your word, and we pray that we will be consistent in learning it and becoming wiser as we continue to apply it to our lives. Help us to continue to move forward advance in the spiritual life. We thank you for your guidance, for your power that you give to us through the Holy Spirit. Help us to keep short accounts and stay in fellowship with you a maximum amount of time. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everybody.